we're going to move into the teaching, but before we do that, Lisa's going to read our scripture yeah. for the teaching. So the scripture today is uh, John 6:35. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one will, who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was beautiful. If you guys have your Bibles, go to the book of John. Uh, if you have your phone, whatever it is, we also will have it on the screen today. We're going to be in John chapter 6. Uh, for the next seven weeks, we're going to be looking at the seven I am statements of Jesus in the book of John. And we thought this would be appropriate for a couple reasons. One, before our Sabbath series, uh, which again, we're still highlighting every week, but before we did that, we were learning about the life of Moses. Anybody remember Moses, right? And we specifically looked at Exodus 3. How does God introduce himself to Moses? He says, I am who I am, right? And so we talked about that a little bit, and we talked about the significance of it, but I also know, you know, it means that he's always was, always is, always will be, but it's also like, okay, that's great, but what does that really mean? And what I love about Jesus, when he comes onto the scene, he's really introducing himself as God by saying that same phrase, I am. And John notes seven different times when Jesus says, I am. And what I love about Jesus is he kind of fills in the blank and says, I am. And one way to know that is I am the bread, the gate, the good shepherd. And there's seven of those. And that's going to help us learn more about Jesus. The second reason I think it's appropriate for us to do this series now is for the next few years, uh, we are going to be very methodical about our teaching series. I like to think we've always been, right, Pastor Kayla? But now, like, we're very intentional. And so if you'll notice, we're going to go through nine different practices emulating the lifestyle of Jesus. So right now is Sabbath. The next one is Scripture. Um, so we're excited about that. But between those series about the lifestyle, about Sabbath, Scripture, fasting, those sorts of things, we want to really just pick a New Testament text and then sometimes an Old Testament text, kind of go back and forth and lean into the love of Jesus and the leadership of Jesus, right? We really pray that you encounter today his love that he has for you and his leadership. And I love how Pastor Caleb said it. He's going to prompt you to do things you don't naturally want to do. And that's kind of how we're going to end our lesson today. It's going to be great. The third and last reason that I think it's great for us to go into this I Am series is we're studying John and it's a perfect time as we're leading up to Easter. Easter is all about Jesus Amen. And it's always been every week, every day is about him. And I think it's a great way to really prepare our hearts as we approach Easter. And on Easter Sunday, we're going to look in the book of John when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And so the seven I am statements are he's the bread, the light, the gate, the good shepherd, the resurrection and life, the way, truth and life, and then the vine. Are you in John chapter six yet? I've given you a lot of time, so go ahead. And so we're going to actually pray now and uh, open our hearts to the Spirit of God. Father God, we just ask you to use this passage in John 6 to satisfy us. Satisfaction is so hard to come by, and I think it's only because it's never found outside of you. And so God, we just bring all of our fears, our anxieties, our guilt, our shame at your feet. And we thank you, Jesus, the invitation today is not to make yourself better, to pick yourself up off your bootstraps. It's, it's the opposite. It's to surrender our life to you, Jesus. And may we find in the free fall of giving ourselves up, we find life in you and life in abundance. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody says, amen. How long can you keep water in your hands? When I was a child, it was my favorite way to water our horse. You know you're from Queen Creek if you have a horse story. So growing up, I would cup the water, and I'd have him drink out of it. And as a seven-year-old, I was always terrified when he'd show his teeth. Isn't that terrifying when the horse just is like, by the way, I have these? And I just always think, like, one day I'll be like this, you know? Like, feet, my fingers are gone. But it, was, but it was like one sip, and he had all the water, right? But if you try to do that without a horse, even without a horse, you're, the water, no matter how hard you try, eventually that water seeps through. It, even if you have the, the tightest grip in the world, the water will find a way to seep out. And it, the older you get, the more you realize that is actually a perfect metaphor for life. Despite your greatest attempts of staying young, we all get old. Despite our greatest attempts to maybe live life forever, our life is out of our hands. It, it, it seeps away. The ending is inevitable. And I think that's not only true for the duration of life itself, but it's also true for our desires in life. Desires for things like accomplishments, 
We have, we do the accomplishment. We think now life will be good. And quickly, soon thereafter, life isn't as good as we thought. So then we chase another accomplishment. Or maybe for you, it's security. Maybe it's a monetary number. If I get there, then I will be safe. But you get there and you don't feel safe, right? It always, your desires, even when you grab them, they seep out of your hand. It's all like water seeping through our hands. Welcome to church. And you're thinking, are we in the book of Ecclesiastes again? (laughs) If you guys were here last year, we talked about Ecclesiastes, and week after week, we just kept saying, life is like a vapor. Uh, Have fun. And it was like, how is this encouraging? But I promise you today's message is, it does have a happy ending because of Jesus. It's a happy ending because Jesus comes onto the scene 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, and he has the audacity to say, life doesn't have to feel like it's just water sleeping, uh, seeping through your hands. He says, in me, you can live a satisfied life that starts now and goes on for eternity. And that claim, that, auda- that audacious claim is found in John chapter 6. So allow me to give you some context before we dive into the main verse being verse 35 about how he is the bread of life. There are two things that happen Uh, that gives you context right before John 6 when we start in verse 25. First, Jesus feeds 5,000. You see that at the beginning of of John 6. Now, 5,000 men, so it's likely that he actually fed 20,000 people. Now, there's one really significant thing to see. There's a few. Uh, What does Jesus start with? Five loaves and two fish from a little boy, right? And then he feeds the whole multitude. But here's what's amazing. Let's talk a little bit about my God, and we could do a whole sermon here. He leaves. He not only feeds all the thousands of people, but there's how many baskets left over? Twelve. So that's a sermon right there, right? God will serve your needs. He'll serve beyond your needs, right? We serve a God of abundance who is over and beyond. But also, we have to recognize, why twelve? In the Hebrew uh, literature, you would quickly realize The Hebrews loved the number 12 because it represented all of Israel. How many tribes are there in Israel? 12. The 12 tribes represent the whole multitude of God's people. So he is saying, look, as I'm feeding you thousands of people, I am leaving 12 baskets over so you know I'm not just here to feed you. I'm here to feed all of Israel, which is incredible. Now, that's in Matthew 14 as well, this feeding of the 5,000. What I love about Matthew is in Matthew 14, he shares the 5,000. He has three little stories, and then he also, again in Matthew 15, shares how Jesus feeds 4,000. Now, we have to ask ourselves, we already learned the story, Jesus fed thousands. Why is Jesus feeding thousands again? So again, this isn't in the book of John, but it is in Matthew. Lean in. Here's what's incredible. This time in Matthew 15, he feeds 4,000, and there's two differences. The first difference, Jesus was in a Gentile environment. So he fed 5,000 in Israel. Then he feeds 4,000 among the Gentiles. But here's what's significant. How many baskets does Jesus leave over? Seven. Cool, huh? No, okay. So what, what does seven mean? Seven means two things. One, it represents the Gentiles. They would be referred to as like the seven kings, the seven nations. This is Gentile land. So he's saying, not only will I fill all of Israel, I will fill all of the Gentiles. Seven also has a number of completion. That'll preach. Jesus says, I'm not only here to feed you, I'm here to feed and satisfy the entire world. So that's context number one. Context number two, Jesus then, in John's gospel, he now walks on water. Now in chapter 6, verse 4, we see the context that all of this is happening in this chapter near the Passover festival, which the Passover festival, we learned in the Moses series, it's remembering what God did to deliver his people. What are the two things they think about most about that Exodus story? One, manna, bread from heaven. So Jesus goes, you remember that bread from heaven story? I am doing that now. I multiplied bread as if it was from heaven to show you. I am the true and better story of Exodus. But the second thing that happens in Exodus is what? They walk through the water. And what does Jesus do to show his divinity? He goes, yeah, y'all had to have the water parted. I just walk on top of it. What is Jesus saying? You know that whole story of the Passover? That Passover points to me. 
And Jesus is the picture of the Passover. He's the ultimate fulfillment of the Exodus. He's the ultimate fulfillment of you and I being in bondage to sin, but we are now raised to life. We are brought away from uh, Egypt into the promised land because of the person and work of Jesus, okay? Now, let's look at verse 25. That's just the context. That was like free, okay? So let's look at verse 25 now, John chapter 6. When they, the people that Jesus had fed, found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Because they were doing the math. They were watching this bread giver. You didn't get on a boat. How were you on this side? We've been looking for you because we're hungry again. Verse 26, Jesus answered, truly, I tell you, you were looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. A sign is saying this is a, there's a greater purpose to the bread. And he's saying, you're missing the greater purpose. You just want more bread. Don't work for the food that perishes, underline that phrase, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set aside his seal of approval on him. Verse 28, what can we do to perform the works of God? Notice how they quickly ask, how can we earn this? Verse 29, Jesus replied, this is the work of God, aka this is not your work, it's God's work, so don't think you can earn it that you believe in the one he has sent, which is Jesus. What sign then are you going to do so that we may see and believe you, they asked. What are you going to perform? So they're not getting it. They've already seen an incredible sign, and now they're asking for more. Verse 31, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. Just as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus told them, truly, I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said, Sir. (laughs) It went from, Okay, sir, whatever you say, just give me the bread. Give us this bread always. In verse 35, I am. The same phrase here that we remember from Exodus 3. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. And no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. I want us to zero in on those two verses, verse 27 and verse 35. Verse 27, don't work for food that perishes. Verse 35, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry or thirsty again. What is Jesus trying to get them to realize? There is a difference between existing and living. There's actually a Greek word here. If you understood the Greek, what he's doing, there's two ways to say life in the Greek. Number one is bios, which is where we get biology, right? The study of life. And this has a understanding of existence. Like if you want to continue to exist, what do you need? Bread and water and shelter, just basic needs, right? So those are good ways to make sure you kind of exist longer. But zoe is less about quantity of life. It's more about quality of life. And this is the word he uses here. Zoe is life and life in abundance. Some of us would say purpose, meaning. Like you can't wait to wake up in the morning, right? It's like when me and my wife are at the beach, I say, this is living, right? This is good. And Jesus is saying he is the only way to that zoe life, the life full of meaning. And so working for food that perishes gives us the illusion. They try to label it as zoe, but it's just bios. Every other way to life will spoil, it will fade, and it will let you down, but not Jesus. This reminds me, David Foster Wallace, he uh, is not a Christian. He was a really well-known author. Uh, Just after he passed away in an untimely death in 2008, they published his commencement speech that he had given to college in 2005. And it really like nails this existential crisis on the head that we all feel if we don't run to Jesus. It's not on your screen, so just listen in. I decided to add it this morning. Okay, so here's what it says. He says, if you worship money and things, if that's the work, the food you work for, If they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. You will never feel like you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you're always going to feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. (laughs) Worship power, you will feel weak and afraid, and you will need even more power over others to keep that fear at bay. Worship your intellect. 
being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. This was a man who experienced a lot of success, and he had to say all of this food just perishes. Sadly, I don't know if you ever found the true meaning to life, but I'm here to tell you today, there is a food that will never perish, and his name is Jesus. Every other plan, every other route in life leads to the same dead end, a feeling of emptiness, regret, and dissatisfaction, and it is super depressing. And how do we battle that depression today? We just look for another menu for more food, and Jesus is saying all of those or what I would call false zoes. They're false promises of the good life. And so as I was thinking through, what are some examples of false zoes, false uh, idols that give us this, this feeling of satisfaction, but they always leave us worse than before? I think James 3.16 is a good template. So James, in his wisdom, he says, for where there is envy and selfish ambition, there is disorder in every evil practice. So let's look at both of those. Number one, the false zoe of envy. To put simply, what is envy? Envy is desire plus resentment. So this is typically our first response when we feel like we've been dealt a really bad hand. And so it's, I want fill in the blank, and I hate you because you have it. That's envy. So it's not like if your neighbor has something, it's not like, okay, good, I want that too. It's like, no, I want what you have so that I have it and you don't. Wednesday morning, I woke up just really anxious. You guys ever do that, right? Because we're human. Uh, and I was just like, I don't know what it is. I did all the right things. I woke up, did my Bible time, did my prayer, studied for this message, and I didn't touch my phone till 10 a.m. I have all these rules, especially when I'm just waking up with an anxious spirit. And it just wasn't going away. And so I text my wife. I said, babe, I'm just not doing well today. And she's like, well, like, go to a movie. Now, here's the thing. Me and her, we, I've always talked about, like, my... My dream scenario, my Sabbath, as you would say, is actually to go to the movies all alone. Anybody else have this weird <laughs> desire in life? Great, just me. Now, so I was like, are you serious? Like, can I go alone? She's, yeah. And so I went and did the most manliest thing possible. I watched Creed 3 and uh, been working out ever since. And, uh, but conveniently, I ordered those loaded nachos with chicken at Fat Cats, y'all it's a good deal. <laughs> like, it's a whole pizza size, and it's just 12 bucks. Like, it could feed your whole family or just one person <laughs> watching, you know, so they're doing the workout scene. I'm like, oh, yeah, I can't wait to go home and work out as I'm indulging in jalapenos and sour cream and ch- praise the Lord. So, anyways, I'm enjoying this movie, but what the movie is all about is envy. The whole movie. Now, if you haven't seen the movie, it's not a spoiler alert because they've already put it on a preview. The whole point is Creed leads a successful life, right? He does the boxing thing and yada, yada. Has all the money, all the great things. But what happens? His friend that they used to hang out with, his friend at age 12 was a better boxer than him, but then this guy at age 12 went to jail, okay? 18 years later, he comes out and he's like, I want to box. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. At this point in the story, he's not a villain. He just wants to get up and, and, and train and learn from Creed. But then you find out along the movie this guy doesn't just want a box. He, want, he wants Creed's life. So he's going to do everything possible to, to, to take his title away, to take his reputation away and give it to himself. To do all these, He wants to not just lift himself up after prison. He wants to tear Creed down. And it's now out. So go to the theaters to see how it ends. But that, what's that whole movie about? Envy. And what do you learn from it? Envy can give you a lot of power. And you should have seen this guy. He was jacked, right? Working out in the prison. I can't wait. I'm going to win. And he's great. But then you learn, this is a spoiler alert, hey, it's not the life you want to live. That's going to tear you apart. Envy will destroy you. You think it's about boxing. No, it's about the biblical principle of envy. All right. (laughs) How do I know I've experienced that kind of envy? It is a false zoe. It is a prompt because it does give you energy and power, but it always goes sour. That that was just right there. I haven't rhymed in a while. It's been too long. Now, write this down. When envy has gripped my life, I mourn when others rejoice, and I rejoice when others mourn. That kind of food perishes and spoils, and it never gives you what you think. You're going to end up alone, 
exhausted and filled with regret. And the reality is, outside of Jesus, envy seems to be one of our only options to run to. Thankfully, Jesus comes down in the flesh and says, I have a better way. Especially for you, if life seems unfair, envy seems to be a promising solution. But friends, envy thrills and then it kills. Envy fascinates and then it assassinates. Envy is, quote, verse 27, working for food that perishes. But there's another route many of us take, and it's almost the opposite, or it can kind of go along the same whatever. The false zoe of selfish ambition. Selfish ambition is the twin desires of winning and being noticed for it. To put more bluntly, it's about domination and then attention for your domination. This is running rampant in our culture, especially the attention part, being better than others part. James K.A. Smith in his memoir of St. Augustine, which I just, I just have been lately telling everybody to read, he said the following, quote, we have traded, us, our generation today, we've traded the hope of immortality for a shot at going viral. We're kind of all recognizing this water is going to run out of our hands, so we might as well do something crazy and get noticed before it, before it all fades to black. So someone that's really riddled with selfish ambition, they have no problem sacrificing their family, no problem sacrificing their morals, just so they can be the best and have a crowd say, good job. It's very, very sad to meet someone with selfish ambition. If you meet someone who's like that, they typically turn every conversation back to their own success story. They actually avoid anyone who doesn't further their agenda. You might see you were friends with someone and then all of a sudden they cut you off. It was nothing they did, but you no longer serve their agenda, so they just cut you out. Selfish ambition, what it does is it renders you incapable of grace. You can't have grace for others. You don't have grace for yourself. And it also makes it impossible to have a spirit of gratitude. Selfish ambition gives you that lie, I have earned this, I'm where I'm at because of how strong I am, you are a loser because you're a loser and I'm a winner. That's a miserable life to live. And Jesus is probably speaking to a crowd full of people with selfish ambition. Cue the famous Thomas Merton line, he says the following, people may spend their whole lives climbing the ladder of success, only to find, once they reach the top, that the ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. We spent our whole life getting there and realizing it was pointless. Selfish ambition, much like envy, is working for food that perishes. It's actually another book wreck. I read Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness by Tim Keller every single year. One line that is so helpful for me, he says, true gospel humility means I stop connecting every experience, every conversation with myself. In fact, I stop thinking about myself altogether. Why? Only in Christ will you find meaning. Only in Christ will you find energy and joy. Selfish ambition can get you some, to some pretty impressive places, but in the end, you will say it was all a waste. If the solution is within us, we will look to envy or selfish ambition. But what if it's not? What if the solution is entirely outside of us? That's the point Jesus is trying to make. Look at verse 47. We're going to skip ahead a little bit. I encourage you to read this whole passage this week. Verse 47, truly I tell you, anyone who believes has eternal life. It's that simple. Just believe. 48, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. That water was great, but it seeped through the hands. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If you didn't understand it yet, Jesus is saying, I'm going to make it really clear. It's me. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Write this down. What is Jesus trying to do? He's saying the bread was a pointer, but Jesus was the point. The manna in Exodus, great story. That points to a God who provides. The feeding of 5,000 men and their families. That's not just about bread. It's about Jesus who is the giver of that good bread. We have a puppy, okay? 
And I'm told they're in the puppy stage, it seems to be like 10 years at this point, but whatever. And the reality is, is with this puppy, we're trying to train him. <laughs> we, my wife is trying to train him. And what I've noticed when I try to jump in there, I always go like, here, you've ever done it? Like, go there. And what does the dog do? Hmm? Just looks wherever the pointer is. Like, no, like, <laughs> sorry. This is going somewhere, right? No, there. And they just look at this one. You know, it's like, no, that's what Jesus is doing. I'm doing this. And you just keep looking at the pointer and you're missing the whole point, right? Finally, my dog was helpful in my life for a good illustration. <laughs> Do you know, I try to get rid of him. I took him to my dad's house. It lasted two weeks. Now we're back. So um, <laughs> pray for me. Now, we think it's about the pointer while we miss out on the whole point. These men and women, they were fueled by envy and selfish ambition, so they thought they found a God who can keep giving them earthly bread so they can get ahead of people. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to stop giving you bread to show you, stop looking, I am the bread. The bread is right in front of you. So now the question we have to ask ourselves, if he is the bread, how do you and I eat it? How do we partake? They asked Jesus that again in verse 28, and it says, what can we do to perform the works of God? They're saying, if we, okay, we want this bread, how do we get it? What do we need to earn? Give us a, a plan. Jesus replied, this is the work of God. It's not what you can do. It's not your performance. It's God alone that you believe in the one he has sent. So what does this mean? How do we get this satisfaction? Believe. Just believe in Jesus. Believe that he is the one who satisfies. Listen, write this down. Satisfaction in Christ is received, not achieved. Notice Jesus doesn't give them a set of rules to abide by. He doesn't give them a dollar amount to give. He doesn't give them an IQ test to pass. In many ways, that's much easier than what he's calling us to do. Because what is he calling us to do? Surrender ourselves. I can't, but God, you can. That's belief. Jesus says, deny your achievements and trust completely in Jesus, which is why we're doing Sabbath. It is a day of the week we say, okay, God, I'm not going to rely on any of what I do. I'm trusting in you and you alone. And so Jesus says this, but notice this master communicator. They hear, okay, the job is to believe. Sure, I'll do it. But then he puts their belief to the test in verse 52. 52, at that, the Jews argued among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Right? He just said, I am the bread. They're thinking, how do we do this? So Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day, because my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. And I would read this passage all the time. I would say, Jesus you, it sounds like cannibalism. What are you doing here? Right? There's a bunch of people. This church might explode. And Jesus sees an opportunity and says, great, I'm going to scare the trash out of all of them right now and say, look at me, eat me, drink my blood, and now you have life. I put on the side of my Bible, Jesus, why did you get weird on them? This is offensive. I want to be like, okay, Jesus, stop. Like, tell them it's a metaphor, right? Like, this is a metaphor. What are you doing here? And yet Jesus doesn't. He doesn't say, here's what I mean. I go and I die on the cross, and when I raise again, now when you believe in me, and we commemorate it by taking the bread and taking the cup, it's a, it's a symbol of his bo my body and my blood. Like, he doesn't do any of that. What does Jesus do instead? He offends them on purpose. He is withholding information on purpose. Why? If submission to Jesus is beneath you, then satisfaction in Jesus is beyond you. What do I mean? I'm so sorry. We have a bad mic today. In verse 29, he tells them to trust and follow his leadership. Some of the crowd were thinking, okay, sure. You keep giving us bread and you keep staying rational, I'll follow you. So, to make sure they were getting the point, Jesus told them to do the thing that sounds weird and that they would never want to do. To follow Jesus is to follow him even when it doesn't make sense. You know? 
If we say like, yes, I'll follow you, I believe you, as long as I like what you say, you're not following Jesus, you're still following yourself. There is a gap there. And Jesus, wanting what's best for these people, wanting to be satisfied, said the only way you'll reach that satisfaction, you let go of that gap. You say, no, Jesus, my yes is on the table. The invitation here is to give yourself for God's use on God's terms in God's time. Say it again. For God's use, on God's terms, in God's time. Is your relationship with Jesus like that? Is Jesus constantly teaching you something new? Are you constantly rearranging your life because he told you to? Do you find him reassuring you with his love? Or are you always in control? Are you always saying, okay, Jesus, I am keeping you at a distance and I will follow as long as it gives me what I think I need and as long as it makes sense to how I think it makes sense. Look at verse 66. Verse 60, by the way, many of his disciples heard this. They say this teaching is hard and they started to walk away. Verse 66, it says, from that moment, many of his disciples, not just the crowd, people who had said, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, they turned back and no longer accompanied him. So Jesus said to the 12, so he's losing this whole crowd. Now he looks to his crew. He says, you don't want to go away too, do you? He's giving them an out. Verse 68, Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. What is Peter saying? He's saying, I don't understand you, but where else would I go? Every other bread perishes. Every other way spoils. So I, I know that you are God, and that means your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. So when push comes to shove, because I have tasted and seen that you're good, I'm going to take refuge in you even when you get weird. Even when you tell me to do something I don't want to do. Ultimately, this bread is pointing to the cross. And we have that invitation every week to say, okay, God, I am surrendering to you. You are Lord and I am not. Every other way falls to the side, but Jesus, you are better. And so this is actually how I think is most fitting to respond because we want to be a people that says submission to Jesus Look, if submission to Jesus is beneath you, then satisfaction is beyond you. No, no, no. So for us, we're going to submit to you, Jesus, and we know that submitting to you ultimately leads to being satisfied in you. And so what I, how I want us to respond to this text is to actually partake in communion. And so in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to come forward while I'm still up here and take the elements. Typically, we just have you take the elements there and sit back. This time, we ask you to take the bread take the cup and go back to your seat and wait, and we're going to partake together. But we're asking everybody who believes in Jesus, this is an invitation for you to come. At this point, let's do it now. For those who are willing and able, let's stand, let's start coming forward and grabbing in the elements. Now, as we gather that line around and we're, we're starting to respond to this message, because Jesus is saying, eat my flesh, drink my blood, What I want us to do is to reflect on two questions. Because I think this is the reflection Jesus is calling us to reflect on in this passage. So the first reflection is, number one, am I too full to be fed by Jesus? What's happening here? The crowd's stomach. You guys can take a seat, by the way, if you have the elements. The crowd's stomach was so full of earthly bread that they didn't have the appetite for eternal bread. You see that? This is one reason why we're calling us a Sabbath. Why? Some of us, before we partake in the elements, we need to acknowledge to God desires in our life, distractions in our life, that we are overindulging in. And because we are indulging in food that perishes, we are missing out on the beauty of the goodness of God. Do you spend time alone with Him? Or have you filled up your time? Do you eat His Word? Or are you too full on real food? The invitation 
Maybe we're over-consuming media. We're avoiding time alone with God. Ambition, money, whatever it is. This is an invitation to maybe say, you know what, God? I am laying that down. I have been too full to be fed by you, and I am saying no. The second question is, am I too stubborn to be led by Jesus? I almost put, am I too smart? Because I think that's how we, we paint it. But it's just being stubborn. Jesus was the smartest person to ever live this planet, so it's not that you're smarter than him. But we're stubborn. Notice how the crowds, they wanted to eat the bread as long as it made sense to them. I wonder how many of us, God is calling you to do something, and you just keep telling him no. He's smarter than you. Quit being so stubborn. Give in. Surrender. He's the only way that's satisfied. His way is better. Are you too full to be fed? Or are you too stubborn to be led? But here's the grace. All you have to do is acknowledge it and say, Jesus, I need you. And you are primed to partake. You don't have to go run the marathon. You don't have to approve yourself. Just say, okay, God, I lay down this and I surrender to you. So I want us to do that. This, this bread, we're going to start with the bread. What this bread represents is forgiveness of our sin in the past. It actually also represents it satisfies our desires. Every desire we have is fulfilled in Christ in the present. And also what's pretty amazing is this bread secures our destiny in the future, that we will have a resurrected body with Jesus for eternity. So let's all, let's give you a moment to lay down, acknowledge those two questions. Am I too full to be fed or too stubborn to be led? Lay that at his feet. Let's partake in the bread together. In the same way, his blood gives us power. What his blood does, and it was represented in this cup, it's just grape juice, don't worry. This blood represents you are saved from the penalty of sin. Not only that, the blood represents you are saved from the power of sin. You don't have to keep going back to that addiction. You don't have to keep going back to that sin because Jesus, when you receive him, has broken free those chains. So you, when we partake in this cup, we're saying, okay, Jesus, because of what you've done on the cross and resurrection, the penalty for my sin is gone. I can be with God forever. The power of sin is no longer here in my life. I don't have to say yes to every temptation. And the other great news is in the future, the presence of sin will be gone forever. As we partake in this cup, we are actually remembering a, a feast that's to come. When Jesus comes back again, he says we're going to have the greatest party of all time. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And as we partake in this cup, it's real small, okay? But in the new kingdom, when we have resurrected bodies, this cup's going to be pretty large. And we're going to celebrate as we partake in that cup in that one day. I don't even want it. Sin's not even around. There's no more weeping, no more crying, no more tears because Jesus has conquered the grave. Jesus has conquered death itself and we can live forever in the kingdom because of his grace. So as we partake in this cup, may we remember what he's done for us in this moment, what he's done for us in this past, but also may we anticipate the beauty of what this cup will give us in the future. Let's partake together.